In this week's video, we're looking at sunscreens. It's time to learn how they work, what to look out for, what ingredients to look out for, how to buy the best sunscreen, how they actually work, and loads more information. At the end of this video, you are going to become a sunscreen pro, guaranteed. Now I appreciate this is going to be quite a long video because it's going to be jam-packed full of information. So if at any point you want to find a specific piece of information, then click on that description below, click on the chapter that you like, and go to it. However, I would highly recommend that you watch the whole video because there's so much to learn. Let's begin. So to begin with, I think that we've all seen sunscreens that come in various different forms, such as creams, lotions, gels, sticks, anything that you can really apply onto your body. And the whole purpose of them is to protect you from the damaging effects of the sun. Now we all enjoy a bit of sunshine from time to time and being exposed to a certain amount is actually really important for us in order for our bodies to make vitamin D, which is needed for healthy bones. But the problem can come from when we're exposed to too much sunlight or for too long without protection. And as wonderful as sunlight is, it actually contains a type of radiation called ultraviolet or UV that we cannot see and too much exposure to this is known to increase your risk to several types of skin cancer including actinic keratosis, basal cell carcinoma, melanoma, Markle cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. In fact it's believed that there's up to 3 million non-melanoma skin cancer diagnoses every single year worldwide which is a massive number and that doesn't just apply to warm countries by the way. Cloudy countries, cold countries like here in the UK as well, it's believed that about 130 13,000 skin cancer cases are diagnosed every year, which is still a massive number, which is why it's so important that we're using sunscreen, that we're using that protection from those UV rays to protect ourselves and our families, and that's probably why you're watching this video. So now let's look at choosing the best sunscreen. Let's first begin with ingredients, okay? When you've got a sunscreen, there's two types of ingredients in them. One of them is a physical barrier, and the other one is a chemical barrier. These are the two different types. They're both effective at protecting you against the sun, but they have pros and cons, which I'm going to discuss now. So let's begin with the physical ingredients, okay, such as titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. If you look on the back of the sunscreen in the ingredients list, you might see it there. The way they work is they form a physical barrier on the skin, so they prevent the UV rays from getting to the skin, they bounce them off, and they protect you, okay? Now, the good thing about the physical barrier ingredients is, one, they work straight away when you apply them, and two, they're less likely to cause an allergic reaction or any sort of reaction to the cream. The bad thing about it, however, is they're not very aesthetically pleasing. And what I mean by that is when you apply a physical barrier sunscreen, it leaves a white residue on your skin, and that's that barrier that we're talking about. If you watch cricket, you'll see cricket players wear it all the time. Their face is usually whitened because of it. So that is a physical barrier. The other con of it is that if you're sweating or if you're jumping in the pool or anything like that, it does come off quite easily, so you need to reapply quite often. Now moving on to chemical ingredients in sunscreens, again you're going to look on the back of the bottle, these are the kind of ingredients you're going to see, such as avobenzone, homosalate, octosalate, these are all chemical sunscreens, okay? And the way that they work is they absorb those UV rays that we spoke about earlier, and they convert them into heat. Now the good thing about chemical sunscreens is that they're light to use, and they don't leave that white residue that we had with the physical barrier, so they're very light, easy to apply. However, the bad thing about them is they take 20 minutes to actually work. 20 minutes it takes for them to actually work. So you need to apply 20 minutes before you go out, before it actually starts to work properly. The other bad thing about them is sometimes, very rarely by the way, some people are a little bit more allergic to the chemical sunscreens than they are the physical ones. So this is another con of it. So when looking at sunscreen ingredients, keep these pros and cons in mind. If you have quite sensitive or acne prone skin or need some protection immediately, a physical sunscreen may be better for you. But if you're going out and don't want a white sheen visible, a chemical sunscreen may be the best for you. There are also many sunscreens out there that use a mix of both physical and chemical ingredients. Now before we move on to the next section, I just want to make a quick note. Please don't be put off the word chemical sunscreens. These have all been trialed and tested. They've got loads of research on them, so you've really got nothing to worry about. But I just want you to know the different types of physical and chemical sunscreens. It's important that you know that. Now I'm going to 
I'll leave more information on these different ingredients in the description below as well if you want more information. Now let's move on. Okay, so I feel like we're really starting to get somewhere now. We now know about the ingredients, we know about physical and chemical sunscreens, but the next thing that I wanna to talk to you about is SPF and UVA star rating. And it's no wonder people get so confused buying sunscreen, because there's so many things that you need to be aware of. So I'm trying to do it in a nice order for you so it all goes in. Let's carry on. So remember when we spoke about UV radiation earlier? Well, there's actually two types. So we've got UVA, which is responsible for skin aging, wrinkles, and tanning. And we've also got UVB radiation, which studies believe is responsible for sunburn and blistering. Now, the bad news is that both UV radiations, both A and B, cause skin cancer. So it's super important that we're protected against the two. So now that we know a little more about that, let's move back onto SPF, because now I'm gonna relate this together. SPF stands for Sun Protection Factor and Sun Protection Factor of UVB radiation, not UVA, only UVB radiation. Now, if you're spending most of your time indoors with only occasional sun exposure, for example, driving to and from work or a short walk outside, you'll want a sunscreen with at least SPF 15. However, if you're going to be spending a lot of time outdoors, walking, doing activities or working outside, you want a sunscreen with at least SPF 30. Now, it's important to know that these are just the bare minimums and when it comes to this, skin tone can make a massive difference. And what I mean mean by this is we have something called a Fitzpatrick skin type chart and this looks at how fair your skin is and what SPF you should really be using. For example, if you're type 1 on the Fitzpatrick scale, that means that you've got very, very fair skin, usually you have freckles as well, very light hair, usually you also burn very, very easily. So if you're someone who's type 1, you need to be using an SPF 50 minimum. Now I'm going to leave more information about this in the description below. I definitely recommend that you have a look at this scale because it's really important. You also want to use a higher SPF if you're particularly vulnerable to sun damage. So this includes babies and children and anyone with a history of sunburn or skin cancer, people with a lot of freckles or moles, immunocompromised individuals and anyone taking medication that increases your sensitivity to light. Now this can include common drugs such as antibiotics like doxycycline, limocycline, ciprofloxacin, as well as diabetes drugs like glyclozide and some water tablets. These are just a few examples by the way, there are many more and I would highly recommend that you do speak to your healthcare professional to tell you if you need to have a higher SPF because of the sensitivity caused by the medication. And please, please, please do bear in mind that children under the age of six months should never ever be exposed to direct sunlight. That's the most important thing that I really want you to remember. Now it's a common misconception that the SPF relates to how much longer you can stay out in the sun without burning. Now let's dive into this a little deeper. Yes, SPF does show how long you can be exposed to the sun, but there are so many variables that are involved that SPF doesn't take into account. For example, how often have you reapplied? How much have you been sweating? Have you jumped in the pool, for example, and it's all come off? There are so many different variables, even the sun, for example, like how direct the sun is, what time of the day is, how much shade you're getting, how much wind factor is, how much chill factor. All of these can have a different effect, and the SPF isn't an accurate science for you to say, okay, it's SPF 30, so I can last this long in the sun without reapplying. This is a flawed method. The best way to apply sunscreen to be on the safe side is reapply every two hours, at least every two hours. Do it more often is even better, but a minimum of every two hours. Okay, so we've now got you covered for UVB radiation, but what about UVA radiation? Well, when it comes to that, you need to look at your UVA star rating. Now, if you're in the UK or if you're in Europe, all the sunscreens do have this on the back, and it's a star system, and it shows you how many stars UVA protection it gives. Now, the minimum you should go for is four star UVA, but ideally, go for five star, that's the top one. But if you can't find five, four will do. So what you want to look out for is the UVA seal. It's a circular logo, usually on the back of the bottle, and it has UVA in the middle of it, and it usually has the number of stars in there. Like I said, five stars ideally, that's the best, but if you can't find it, four will do as well. Now, if you're in the USA, they don't, technically, they don't have the UVA seal because it's a European thing, but I've been to the US many times and I've bought sunscreen there many times and I've always seen the UVA seal on the back of it. They have something called the PA scale, however, and again, it works in a similar way to what we've just discussed. So to summarize, what we're looking for is a high SPF, at least 30, however, remember the scale that I spoke about earlier and do look at that, and also a high UVA scale of at least four stars 
preferably five stars, but if you can't find it, four stars will do. That is what we are looking for when we're looking for a sunscreen. Sometimes it might not say it either, and it will say something like broad spectrum sunscreen. That is also a marker that is a high SPF and it's got a high UVA star. Okay, so I really feel like we're getting somewhere now. We know about the ingredients, we know about UVA, we know about UVB, we know about SPF. We're really starting to become a bit of a pro at this. But the next question is, how do you choose the best sunscreen for you? You're walking down those aisles and you're seeing these creams, lotions, sprays, sticks, whichever, gels, and you think, Thinking, well, which one should I buy? Don't worry, Abraham the pharmacist has got you covered, let's go. So when applying sunscreen, it's recommended that this is done daily to all areas of exposed skin, and this includes your face, neck, ears, and head. And if you're bald or don't have much hair, the different formulations out there suit different areas and different skin types better. For example, creams are great for use on the face and are especially useful if you suffer from dry skin. Creams are thicker and more moisturizing, so they're good for this purpose but might feel heavy to apply to large areas like the rest of your body. For the rest of your body, lotions can be really useful for applying large quantities at a time. Lotions have a higher water content than creams and this makes them easy to spread and apply over larger areas like your arms or your legs or your entire body. Sunscreen gels can also be used on the body as well as the face and as they are water-based, they're a great option for oily skin. Gel sunscreens are less sticky and don't clog your pores as much as heavier formulations like creams, so are one of the best options if you're prone to acne and spot breakouts. Now you can also get sunscreens in the form of sticks. These can be more useful if you're traveling or if you don't want it to leak anywhere. And they're also useful for hard to reach areas or places that are difficult to apply. For example, like under the eyes. But please remember, if you are gonna use a sunscreen stick, it's recommended that you use it at least four times back and forth when you're applying it to get an even spread and the actual amount of coverage that's needed. And lastly, you can also get sunscreens in the form of sprays. Some people feel these are good for use with children, but there are quite a few things you need to keep in mind with them. Spray sunscreens can be used on the body only, and they should never be used directly on the head, hair, or face due to the risk of inhalation. And as children never seem to sit still, they're a bit like me, they move about everywhere when they're speaking and when you're trying to apply sunscreen on them. Ideally, the sprays aren't really useful for them. I don't like them because of this risk of inhalation. Creams are probably a lot better, or the lotions, like we said, are a lot easier to spread on and even if they're moving about you're not worried about the, the risk of inhalation really and as with all aerosols as well you need to be mindful not to use them near open flames and cigarettes as they can be highly flammable this is something to especially keep in mind if you're applying sunscreen near an outdoor barbecue and on top of this, although spray sunscreens may seem convenient, when they're used properly, they should actually be sprayed on the skin and then rubbed in with your hands to get even coverage and sufficient protection. Taking all this into account, sprays are not always as convenient as they originally seem, but nonetheless, they can still be very useful for some people. So that's the pros and cons of the different types of formulations, so you've got a better idea of what to buy, but the most important thing is, buy what is the most convenient for you. You're the most important person here because you're going to be using it. So if you think that's gonna be more convenient for you, then go for it. Now it's great that you're watching this video and you're interested in using sunscreens, but please remember sunscreens don't block 100% of all the UV radiation. So it's super important that you're doing other things as well to protect yourself and your family from the harmful effects of the sun. Now in short, it's super important that when you're outside, you also follow other measures to stay safe. So this includes spending more time in the shade when the sun is the strongest, which in the UK is usually between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. Covering with long sleeve clothing, wearing a wide brimmed hat, wearing a long skirt or trousers, wearing sunglasses with wrap round lenses and making sure that you never burn. Now, even when this advice is followed, you may end up burning as well. You might end up getting some burn if you're not following the advice properly, not applying your sunscreen properly. There's so many different variables that could happen, which is why it's super important if you do get some burn that you speak to your healthcare professional, make them aware of it so they can help you. Now, mild sunburn can be treated at home and I do have a video all about this topic already, which I will leave a link to up here and in the description below. However, it's super important that if you do get some burn and you experience any of these sort of symptoms, such as blistering, headaches, nausea, vomiting, shivering, anything like this at all is indicating a more severe sunburn and you need to seek medical attention quite urgently. And please do remember that repeated sunburn 
increases your chance of skin cancer quite drastically. So it's super important that you're protected and you're aware of this though, that you protect yourself and your family. Also, please keep an eye on any moles that you've got. I do have a video all about moles as well, which I will leave a link to up here and in the description below. I'll also leave a bit more information about these moles and what you need to look out for in the description too, which I highly recommend that everyone reads. So that's the end of this week's video. Thank you for watching. I really hope that you found this information helpful. You now know everything you need to know about sunscreens. You're a bit of a sunscreen pro. So tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone. You now know about the ingredients. You now know about the formulations. You now know about SPF, UVA, UVB, and all the other things that you can do to reduce your chances of burning. So you're a sunscreen pro. Enjoy the sun, have fun this summer, but also remember to stay safe. Thanks for watching. Always remember that you're awesome and I will see you next week. Hey guys, thanks for watching this week's video. Make sure to click that like, follow or subscribe button now to stay up to date with new weekly videos.